Okay, so welcome everybody to this virtual interim meeting of the core working group. Uh, I'm Marco Tigolka, my co-chair is uh, Jaime Jimenez, and I should show you this usual slide. It's an official ITF meeting, so do not well apply. We are recording. If you're not familiar with this, uh, take time to become familiar with it. It's not just about IPR, also about code of conduct, so uh, be nice with each other. And the agenda for today is about three uh, items mainly. Uh, first, we go through the HRF document. We had a resubmission uh, last week. So it's about checking the status and the remaining open points before it can proceed to working group last call. Uh, second point is an idea from Christian on a possible new co-op option that started out from a discussion uh, on ad hoc actually. And third point, we can check the status, current issues, and way forward for the problem details uh, document. So does anyone want to bash this agenda in any way? No, okay. Then we can right move on to the first item, uh, href. That should be Karsten. Do uh, you want me to share anything if you uploaded anything right now, Karsten, or do you plan to share slides? No, I tried to make slides and it turned out that we hadn't changed anything. Um, okay. So <laughs> the, the, the high level view of what href does uh, hasn't changed one bit. So the, the, there really isn't that much to, to talk about. Uh, but if you can open the, the draft, maybe the HTML uh, draft, um, uh, we can look at the CDDL briefly yes. and uh, see how how the internals have changed a bit. Yes, just a second. All right. Can you guide me through? Yeah, it's not exactly the HTML version, but th that one will do. And uh, yeah, I don't have it open at the moment, but you're getting close. Yeah, there we are. Yeah, and maybe you can uh, zoom in a little bit. Most def. Command plus or control plus. One more. Okay, so uh, what you are seeing there is uh, the CDDL for a CRI reference, um, which is the, the thing that allows you to write uh, both absolute CRIs and the things that get combined with a base CRI to, to do relative uh, resolution. And um, what we essentially did is we made this much closer Oh, that's the previous version. Um, yeah, but but it's close enough. Um, yeah, I, I didn't remember that that we fixed one thing in the repository. Um, <clears throat> so um, essentially, the the um, thirty nine eighty six uh, structure. contains the host and port, and that's the part that's wrong in, in this CDDL. It, it subsumes the, the scheme under the authority. That, that's, of course, not right. Um, then we have the path, uh, the query, and the fragment. And th there are a few changes here. First of all, uh, as in CoAP, we are uh, dividing the query into multiple query parameters separated by the uh, end signs. 3986 doesn't do that. And um, we uh, also uh, allow numeric labels for, for the scheme and binary uh, IP addresses. But essentially, this, this is very, very close to uh, 3986, at least the absolute version. And what's new here is this weird discard thing, uh, which is essentially saying, this is a relative reference, and the discard value tells you how much of the uh, existing path uh, you are supposed to throw away. And th there is still some, some remaining weirdness about the discard value, and, and Klaus and I haven't quite managed to uh, fix that uh, yet, but I think we are 90% uh, 
um, uh, there. So instead of giving a, a, a scheme and authority, uh, you can give a discard value. And this is essentially a consolidated dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash uh, from, from the uh, reference. But of course, a relative reference doesn't have to have uh, a dot dot slash dot dot uh, uh, part. Uh, so the, the discard value you get if you just give a path um, is one because you throw away the uh, a relative path, throw away the last component of the base path. And if you um, don't have a path at all and, and give uh, only give query and, fr and, and or fragment, uh, then the discard value is zero because you're not changing the uh, base, uh, the path from the base. Um, so that's uh, pretty much, uh, um, it's the same high level structure it was before, but in, before we had numbers on, on each of the components. And now we have a, a, a syntax that uh, you essentially have to uh, step through linearly to find out which parts of the reference go into which uh, component, or we call them section because this card is its own uh, uh, section. And if you go down to a table that, that should follow, yeah, exactly that table, that's essentially the six sections. We have the five components, uh, scheme, this, this is really authority, scheme authority, uh, path, query, and fragment are, uh, work the same as, as in 3986. And discard is that, that number that compresses the dot dot slash uh, stuff and tells you how to, to operate on, on the uh, base part. And the, the E value essentially tells you uh, how much of the base path you actually throw away. So as soon as you actually give a path in in the relative. Well, Karsten, if I understood what I'm reading correctly, because I think it's the first time I've read this. Um, if 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 it starts with a false or minus one, it's a co-op or could be a string. But if it's an integer zero to one twenty seven, then it's a discard. Yes. Okay. So. Um, Actually, there is, I don't know if it's in, in this version. Um, maybe you really should go to the repository. I'm sorry. Um, uh, we have submitted that when we had about 80% done, and then uh, we worked on it some more, and now we have about 90% done, and that's in the repository. So if you can go to the HTML there. Are you thinking you might want to have a co-author from W3C, Mark Knott, maybe Mark Nottingham or someone else like that? Well, that's a, that's a great question because essentially we, we have to decide what we actually want to do here. Um, so is, is this going to replace your eyes? And I think it won't. Um, it really is a, a representation of the, the same concept that your eyes uh, use um, in the um, context of, of constraint resources. Um, so yes, in the end, of course, some, some 3986 experts should look at that, but they probably will, will die at the moment when, we see, when they see that we don't even do percent encoding. And I'm not sure we can resurrect them because before they can go to the juicy parts. So there should be a, a editor's draft somewhere. Yeah, I'd rather they died early. <laughs> <laughs> right? Not during working group last call or IETF last call. That's all. Yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I, I mean, <laughs> if, when we have our ducks in a row, we probably should tell them. Well, actually, I, I think, think that we should tell them before because I think that we they need to feel that we're still in a position where we could change. Yeah, um, 
I'm sure we can change things even when we have everything in a row. Yeah, we, we still have a few bugs in, in the text, I think. And when, when those are fixed, I think it's a very good uh, idea yeah. to approach the uh, URI community and get some feedback. So um, right the now, latest and greatest is in, in a pull request. I'm not sure if we are generating uh, HTML from that. I don't think so. So you, you have to go. We to usually, the pull do, we usually do. If you're in the branch and then click on the, if you go to the branch that the pull request is based on, and then click on the, um, on the editor's copy, then you redirect it into ah, the new branch. syntax. Yeah, that's the branch. Thank you, Christian. <laughs> I worked on this a week ago, so I have already completely forgotten how we do this. So which pull request? New syntax. syntax. Yeah, yeah, but but don't go into the pull request. Go into the um, go into the code. Um, top left code. Oh right. I, I think and we have to set up go to the, the branch. That is not master, but okay. New syntax, and then if you click on um okay yeah the editor's copy isn't built because this is a bit of yeah it's just this is not using hard. the library yeah <laughs> then you'll just have to go into the markdown here and hope that it doesn't blow up in our faces the the draft itf core hra md okay we can get back to the draft then no, no. Um, the the new syntax, uh, the, the news, the tip of the new syntax uh, pull request is not submitted yet, hmm. because we have to finish this one thing about discard and the e value of discard. But if you uh, just open, if you open the MD, mm -hmm. then this will be a little bit ugly, but uh, <laughs> it will be ninety percent. Uh, readable. No, where was that? This one, right? Uh, <laughs> oh, Markdown is great. It's because it's standardized. And there's yeah, 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 yeah. I usually try to make sure that that uh, my my Markdown is GitHub compatible, but uh, apparently I forgot that. Each time my computer reboots, uh, Emacs forgets some of the settings that's needed for that. <sighs> if you hit throw, then we can access the TXT. Oh, that's better. Yes. <laughs> Particularly if you zoom in. I zoom in. Control plus. So what did I want to show? <laughs> Yeah, that, 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 that. Um, so um, can you zoom into the table? Um, this essentially tells you uh, which component comes first based on which type the first item in, in the query has. Um, so if it's false or a negative integer, it's a scheme. And if it's, uh, uh, yeah, we, we should be using Martin Thompson's uh, thing and, and then it would be easy, but uh, uh, we, we haven't done that yet. Um, and um, true or bytes means it's an authority and uh, a, a non-negative integer is uh, uh, discard and the text is path and array is query and uh, null value, if you see a null value as the first element, then you have a fragment. Uh, only. So this is kind of the, the um, prefix table that anybody who, who knows about parser generators uh, probably recognizes. Maybe as a quick background, um, why we made this change uh, a long time ago. Uh, we had uh, an interim meeting where we discussed uh, the, this very same uh, section um, and, and the CDDL. And we noticed that, uh, of course, when we have uh, our URIs and CRIs, we need to uh, store the values um, of, of these components. And we also need to have delimiters. So 
we know when, where the values start and end and, and what they mean. And at that point in time, uh, we had uh, in CDDL where the uh, delimiters were a bit verbose. So what, what we have now achieved is that we have uh, a new CDDL where the delimiters are basically as, as compact as it can get uh, if we want to keep fine alignment. Um, the um, downside maybe of, of this is that um, you have to spend a bit more time uh, thinking on how to implement this. And the code for, for decoding a CRI also becomes slightly larger um, because you now, now have to basically implement a, a small parser that, that um, you, you uses a, a one look ahead to determine what, what is the actual structure of a CRI and instead of having uh, tagged key value pairs that tell you immediately what it means. So I, I think I'm very happy personally uh, with the compactness of the new format. I think I, I need, still need to, to sleep one or two nights over this if I'm happy with the slightly more complicated um, parser that, that everybody would have to implement. The, the problem a bit overall with your eyes is that nothing of this is intuitive. Uh, m most of your eyes are defined algorithmically and uh, trying to understand what, what uh, discard and, and so on means uh, often leads to frustration. You, you have to implement it uh, and then your code tells, tells you what happens when you do different things. Uh, it, it's a bit unintuitive to, to try to understand what, what exactly is going on. That, that's a bit the frustrating part here. Yeah, so um, essentially what, what my code does is uh, it just steps uh, uh, through the curry and uh, finds those six uh, sections that are shown here and um, essentially um, puts pointers for these six uh, sections somewhere into a variable so you know where they are uh, in, in the structure. And uh, then essentially you have a fully decoded uh, CI uh, in front of you. Those, those no, don't even necessarily need to be saved in between. So I've done a few experiments with uh, with a Rust-based uh, CRI parser, and there are optimizations that basically, if, if done right, the, the, the compiler should be able to optimize out much of this and become uh, and and then uh, relative re resolution becomes a, becomes a topic of parsing over those two two streams and lots of again. Yeah, it's like like five or six lines of code um, in my code, except that um, I don't have the discard thing <laughs> completely under control yet. Uh, are there other main points left? Otherwise, no. I think we, we just have to to finish those last ten percent, um, and uh, so essentially what we did here. Uh, um, um, a bucket of algorithms that can do something on text strings, and we abstracted the information model. And then we, we implemented the information model in a different representation, but still the same information model with a few simplifications. And I already mentioned uh, percent encoding, uh, which allows a lot of complexity uh, in your eyes. And, and we got a, approximately 80% of the value of, of percent encoding by, by doing thing rights in the first place. Um, and by by actually parsing the the query um, component uh, into an array, um, so there, there is uh, you would have uh, to have a very weird application that still needs percent encoding here. Um, so we can, uh, yeah, Thomas. My my problem is uh, the, my internet. Uh, um, connection is, is from Deutsche Telekom and it's not 
working very well at the moment. Okay. So we, Thanks. we actually had a had a class um, explode an hour ago <laughs> <Ooh. laughs> because telecom completely lost the routing. And uh, sorry Just about that. If, if it's BT instead. So the the, the fun is the 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 packets go through, but the standard deviation is 700 milliseconds and i don't think chrome can deal with with the media streams with a standard deviation of 700 milliseconds makes sense yeah, so what, what i think is left to do is um f finalizing the the uh, thoughts on the discard. Uh, then, um, as I said, uh, I think we have a few bugs in, in the document and we, we need to flush those out. And the best way to do that would be if we uh, could get a bunch of independent implementations that literally just look at the draft and, and try to create an interoperable implementation from that. And, and then uh, we, we might have some questions on disagreements on how things are uh, to be. So th those implementations we have so far, uh, the, the authors are a bit spoiled by, by talking to each other. So we, we need to do the exercise of creating independent implementations. Yeah. Klaus, you're planning to add in a reference implementation in an appendix of this, maybe? Um, so th there's the companion uh, repository on GitHub mm. where I uh, have started creating a reference implementation and i also plan to uh, keep some test vectors there for for implementers i'm not sure if i would include the code in the appendix but maybe that's something to discuss yeah. this is an aid of corral i think who else is going to be able to use it that doesn't already have a uri scheme Sorry, can you say again? Um, so this work is going to be referenced in Corral, I think. Yes. Um, and then, who is there other users of it that you anticipate? Um, um, I don't know any by name right now, but I can imagine that basically everywhere where you um, want to express your eyes in Seabor, uh, it would be a candidate to use CRIs instead. So, for example, Karsten has his um, authorization IAF format, uh, which is using a lot of um, URIs, and that might be also a candidate for CRIs. So, I'm just thinking, so uh, I would recognize that it's a, this thing from a tag or from the fact that it uh, it's a, starts with a an array rather than a a byte array. If I had something that was already using URIs, could I? How could I put this in unambiguously? I guess we would want to have a seaboard tag for this. Okay. But the risk for confusion is is relatively low, given that uh, a, a CRI will usually be encoded in a byte string completely, and a URI won't fit there. or will be encoded as a text string, if anything. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, is that it shows up if it's a text string, then it's a URI. If it's, if it's an array, then it's a CRI. A CRI would be a, would be a binary string, not an array. Not, not an array? I thought that I saw that it, the you, CDDL said it was an array. The CDDL says it's an array because we don't have terminology to say that it's actually a SIBO sequence. Oh, I see. All right, thank you. So it seems clear what's left to do. Any more points before we move to the next topic for today then? 
do, do we randomly want to volunteer some people as uh, implementers? Hey. Of course. I could give it a shot. Okay, thank you. Uh, we can move to the second topic, the new option from Christian. And Christian, you want to try sharing your screen? You're doing that it, already. Yeah, Great. It, it seems to work when you don't do it from the browser, but from, from the WebEx application. Um, so uh, context of this is that in ad hoc, as long as you start, uh, start an ad hoc exchange, by requesting dot well known ad hoc, you well you go through the uh, you you send eighteen bytes of dot well known slash ad hoc, which is a significant portion of the of the length of a of a message one, um, and yeah. So the, the the question that came up basically during 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 uh, during the hackathon before the last ITF was, uh, can we do better and my impression is that we can quite easily do better by simply defining an option that shortens that URI. So um, this is something that we could do if that issue became pressing and just say there is a new option, say 501, because it doesn't need to be kind of that short because it will still save us like 15 bytes and that should be defined as mutually exclusive with the URI path and proxy URI. Uh, it would be kind of an alias, alias to, to having the URI path option, and that would be it. And if someone were motivated to say that, hey, this could be URI value, then it could be used for well-known core two, uh, one of those would get the three bytes of byte option, one of those would get the four byte option, but that would be relatively simple. The question to me, so the question here is, can we do better? And I think we can, even without um, doing it differently on the wire because so uh, ad hoc. Can you explain the the what was on the previous slide? Um, the order. How, how does this work? Um, well, the, um, ba basic, basically every in every situation where you would serialize those two options eleven dot well known and ad hoc. Um, instead, you serialize a bit later in the in the option stream an option 501, and the your I parser at the at the other end of the thing needs to of course needs to recognize that option, and says yeah um, I haven't seen any URI option or proxy scheme, but I see this I know this and instead of kind of going through my tree of of um, resources I right away slot this into well known at home. But you, you would, the puzzle would see the query before seeing that. Yes. Okay. Um, th that, that is a limitation of this, but then again, at least the well-known ad hoc URI doesn't take query parameters on the way. Okay. And your point three is, it, are you giving it a specific thing for core or are you giving it a, 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 a IANA table for future well knowns. Um, so if 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 I'm going back one slide, um, I'm not doing anything at all so far. This is just introducing the idea, and all those are of course options. So we could, um, we could have just hard coded these two things. We could have an IANA table. Okay. Um, this is pretty much open open so far. Um, we would map okay. value zero to ad hoc and value one to core and yeah, value yeah. two to RD and something like that. Yes. Right. And and the internet only really needs two hundred and fifty six URLs anyway. So. <laughs> well, I think that the well known list should fit within one byte, but then again, not all of those are really relevant to to core. Um, um, and I mean, it's it would be a and option, so it would be virtually unlimited anyway. Yeah, I I understand. Um, so th this is something we could I mean if if it turns out that ad hoc runs into a limitation there, this could be done there locally, defining that option, leaving and 
basically only needing needing that one point clarified about whether we assign core manually, whether we have IANA policy, those details. The other thing, of course, is that this uh, creates an interoperability problem because parties may or may not know uh, what that is short for. Um, and for ad hoc, it would be pretty clear cut because if this were to be created with ad hoc, then this should be mandated for ad hoc implementations and problem solved. Um, retrofitting it into well-known core, of course, not that easy and would usually create a, a, four, a four or something bad request um, case, which would then need to be resolved. So typically this would be used in deployments where everyone is aware that this is being used here because we are so and so constrained. But it might be nice, and this is where the generalization topic starts. Um, it might be nice to allow intermediaries to recognize that and possibly even help recognizing it or allow libraries to consume those shortcut options in a more in an easier way than having to manually implement additional code for an additional option. And I think this is where Schick could come in. So everything I'm describing from here on um, is purely a matter of describing the same procedure differently. It would on the wire and in some implementations look just as I described it before. Um, but implementations could choose to use an understanding that is based in Schick and then, for example, be updated more easily because um, thinking of the AIO co-op implementation that I maintain, um, I would not implement a new option, but just add an entry to a table of, no, of known options that have this uh, SIG compression, compression style rules. Um, so once there is a format for, for SIG compression and decompression rules, and I think there is not yet, uh, this can be, become machine readable and used for different options. So for example, we've talked about the, the binary uh, host names that uh, that Corey, uh, Corey's offer, at some point someone could be annoyed by having by, by the only op place in their own in their embedded code that still has hex encoding in there being the being or decimal encoding being the URI host option because it has a byte string that is a, an IP literal and um, describe maybe even for their own even only for their own application a URI host literal option that transforms a byte string that is four bytes for IPv4 and uh, 16 bytes for IPv6 um, back and forth into a URI host that is ASCII or hex encoded. And I think there are there, there are, it's not not in the not in the currently registered options, but in 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 the options that are around in in current internet drafts. I think there is some potential for describing some options in terms of such compression. That doesn't mean that they have to be normatively described that way, and that doesn't mean that they have to be implemented that way. Um, but I think it's it would be a convenient check to see that those option semantics are easy to understand because they can be understood in terms of another option that is just a bit more verbose or that uh, would need, that was actually sent in the request and not in the response. Um, one might even take this a bit further and uh, not only look into compression and decompression rules that SHIP offers, but also into uh, fragmentation and reassembly rules. And then the ad hoc option of OSPOR ad, ad hoc um, would become simply a shorthand for sending two requests and receiving two responses. Now there's only a limited set of responses that can be combined back there, but then again, there's only two but by the very nature of how the how Oscarator works, there is only a limited set of outcomes as well. So um, I think it would be expressible that way. The questions that come from this are then um, a um, do we want this? Especially do we want this urgently? Because um, so how how pressing is the need on the ad hoc side um, to to save those fifteen bytes? And the other question is. Is there real value in this generalization I've been describing?
I must admit, I don't really have a, a good grasp uh, for the the amount of complexity that uh, adding chic uh, adds to a node. I mean, it's it's clear if you want to do LoRa or something like that, you you have to have that complexity. But uh, uh, in in a wider environment, I have no idea. I don't even think that in in I think that in many cases this would not be adding chic to that node. It okay. would be more like um, Adding, adding chic to the code generator that creates your co-op library, possibly, um, or not at all, or just to use it as an, in understanding. So if, if some component already does use chic, then they will probably implement it that way because they have that all, already available. If it does not, there is still, I mean, you can implement the, you can implement everything that's in ad, OSCORE ad hoc without this, no question. Um, you, it's just an alternative way that's opened by describing it as, and by the way, it also works if you view it through that lens. So uh, I, what I'm hearing, Christian, is that we could do nothing, write no document, and simply say that um, Laura people, et cetera, who are using Schick anyway, will put this in because they'd be dumb not to. Um, and other people who are less bite sensitive will maybe or maybe not but we don't know in a sense yes so there could actually be an appendix somewhere that, that shows how to use uh shake properly to to make this great for ad hoc and make all the numbers look really great It, it 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 could also be just a bit a piece of of guidance on how to on 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 kind of a, a check that you can do if you define a new co-op option that says um if you're defining a co-op option and you're unsure about whether you're doing it right try to phrase it in terms of existing options and just make it a, a conversion and then you'll see whether it works out or not Yeah, I think this is interesting, Christian. I need to digest it a little bit more. Uh, but uh, I mean, the general approach, I think, is right. I mean, from from uh, from the set things where where we have these overhead uh, issues, then at least addressing the the well-known URI, I think, is it would step in the right direction. And then maybe even go further. But I. I need to think more. Uh, just a comment here on the parallel between uh, this and the ad hoc option for the OSCORE ad hoc document. Uh, maybe the parallel with, um, well, not ad hoc exactly for that combined request is a particular case and not a general case. Because from an ad hoc point of view, that combined request is trying to target um, the exact same ad hoc resource that was targeted by ad hoc message one. Um, but there can be more ad hoc resources on the server, for instance, to support multiple uh, applicability statements. Yeah, but right. I wouldn't rely on an ad hoc option hitting anything else than the well known ad hoc, because if you have multiple ad hoc resources, those might. Um, those might be completely independent processes because they are for completely independent applications, and those might even use the same um, the, the same the same number space in different ways because they rely on the request coming in all over that channel again. Um, so if also the elsewhere ad hoc option were to be used with any other ad hoc resource, I'd be a bit careful here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, do you have more slides, by the way? I think that's uh, no. more. Ah, okay. <laughs> I, I ended with questions, but scrolled back to the one that probably needs a bit more digestion. Okay. Thank you, then. And of course, more comments are welcome also on the list.
Chris, just one final question for me. Is is the do you propose? I mean, are, are there different options here, um, or is it one of one proposal with more potential granularity? So, so that I mean, it, are there op is there one option, one alternative that we define a co-op option which handles your eyes or sort of well known somehow no. and compresses those? I, I or, think or is, yeah. A single a single option that deals with well known with well known URIs is what I think is the is the core of every way this could go. The, the um, and whether we do that depends on how how important it is for the ad hoc applications to to have this. And anything else that um, is then basically just um, is is background is is additions on top of that. But it wouldn't change how that single option, say five hundred one, would look. Okay, thanks. Because I think I think that that is definitely um, worth doing, but not I mean not restricted to ad hoc, but for for a general case, I think. So I'm in favor of that. How did you arrive at the number five hundred one? um more or less um going i was going for the uh, for the two byte uh, space um taking one of the lower ones that would not usually be hit by any combination of earlier options plus um uh, earlier options plus a small data so i'm trying to stay out of the two, uh, 256 257 area and then i just picked something larger Okay, so why are you trying to stay out of that? Um, primarily because the 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 suggestion is to. It, what, what I'm trying to get across is that uh, we could do this without even without standards action, um, if of course we want um, we uh, get the experts to agree that this is something useful, then we could lower it into the into the one byte uh, into the one plus one byte range. And it would work there just as well. Okay, forget the the um, IANA considerations for web option numbers. I have to look it up. So, but but is there is there any? I mean, if if people agree that this is valuable, is there any reason why we should not aim for a lower value of the option? Probably except, not. except that you, yeah, okay. Okay, thanks. Um, I have a question on a talk um, that maybe is stupid, but I haven't read the draft. If I have a URI, how, how do I know if I'm supposed to use DTLS or ad hoc? So there might, there are, there is something called the applicability statement associated to an implementation and that can describe how, that should, should describe how you identify a message as an ad hoc message. It could be if, if I have a link and that contains a URI, it starts with co-op colon slash slash or co-op s colon slash slash. Do, do we have then a co-op e for ad hoc colon slash slash or, or do we use co-op s for everything and then we, we have to have some kind of negotiation round trip at the beginning? Co-op co s is co reserved for that DTLS. Agreed, but co-op e is an interesting proposal. That doesn't make sense. Um, in order to be able to use DTLS, uh, you have to have a ton of context already. Um, so that ton of context could tell you that uh, this co-op s UI actually goes uh, via ad hoc. I don't agree that you need that much context to use it, but um, 
you're you're i think you're right for many cases but not for all cases not for all cases yeah i agree dtls in 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 co-op is already used differently than co-op over http so in co-op over http there's this general assumption that anything that's signed by the by the um by any of those all known to be good uh, CAs is valid, but in co-op S, you could be in either situation. And whatever tells you whether you, you're supposed to trust the, the large list of CAs or whether you're supposed to have a key for that, uh, for the particular application as it's used with, with Lightweight M2M will also tell you whether you're supposed to use anything different. So the, the background for my question is that if we have those additional context where that, that we need to, to securely set up a connection, can, can we stick the uh, well-known ad hoc into that? So it, you, in, essentially every server could uh, have its own endpoint for setting up ad hoc. Um, it doesn't have to be well-known if you can discover that, that server-specific endpoint somehow. And while we're at it, uh, we also uh, have the situation in Coral that you want to uh, agree on a vocabulary or some dictionary of vocabularies. And uh, we, we, we sticking that into the same context uh, would, would simplify things a lot. Uh, yeah, I mean, this, the use of well-known ad hoc is, is an example in, 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 uh, in the ad hoc draft, so so you don't need to use it, but it's sort of one one way to get this uh, uniform and, and an e easy way to to identify ad hoc messages. But as you as you propose and as as uh, as I stated before here, it's, this is really up to the application how you want to identify that you receive ad hoc messages. So you can assume things that are available to both sides and okay so that. then one solution to the 18 byte problem might be if an application doesn't like it it has to do simply define something else is that right yes that's one solution I think there's a bit of a um, there there are different application spaces and some have this context and some do not and Klaus as you mentioned if you get tossed the URI and are told to start with that uh, then you lack that context and and then well known core is pro uh, well known ad hoc is probably a good good way to try starting ad hoc and see what comes of it. So well known core next. Can we, can we stick our vocabularies into a well-known? Maybe maybe that's some some follow-up dis discussion. But uh, we we keep discussing these uh, context information for I think quite some time. And uh, what one area is definitely these uh, security parameters, and uh, another area now uh, shows up in Coral with uh, negotiating dictionaries and, and vocabularies. Yeah, I think what what <clears throat> most people don't don't uh, think about is uh, the situation where you get tossed a URI. Is is um, I mean that that's not exactly how it works. Um, there must be a reason to actually dereference that URI, and that reason is is the first element of that context. And uh, if if uh, the the that part of the system that supplies the reason can also define other things. Um, then we have more in that context. True. Can, can we standardize something there? Or is it so application dependent that we shouldn't even try? Well, we might be able to give it uh, vocabulary. 
um, which is probably as far as we will get, but that might still be extremely useful. Okay, the question thanks. is question are, are, the question is are we reinventing the IDs here? Which is maybe a good idea. Uh, or having you know the DID uh, format backed by something else, which is not a blockchain. Is is reinventing DIDs a good idea or DIDs a good idea? D using DIDs is a good idea, maybe. To bootstrap all the you know uh, establishment of a security context and, and secure discovery of other parameters that are API dependent. I must admit I have forgotten just what everything you know about DIDs, but. Uh... What my the impression that the ideas left in my brain were uh, another layer of interaction, and I re already have good ways to do interactions. Um, so, yeah, maybe I have to look at them again. Mm. Maybe in the context of Cora, we can have you know second pass over. Okay, thank you. Then again, the discussion can also continue on the list and uh, possibly fork into new topics. Um, we can switch to the third item for today uh, from Thomas. And Thomas, do you want to share the slide yourself or should I? Could could you please sh Absolutely. share it for me, Marco, please? Yes. Thank you. Thanks a lot. That should but be it. Can you hear me well or? Yes. Okay. So yeah, so this is uh, the status update for the for the problem details draft. Uh, next, please. Okay, a quick recap of the timeline. So we adopted the draft in May, 2020, and, and uh, on the premise that this would be a coral embodiment rather than uh, the the raw seaboard that, 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 that was in the individual draft. And, and the idea was that we'd use it to put to the test some of the coral machinery. Um, and, uh, and this was zero, zero. Then we published zero one uh, just before the cutoff preceding uh, ITF 108, if I remember correctly. And, and this included some restructuring uh, of, the, of the content and, um, and possibly also a bunch of small fixes. Uh, then after the summer, uh, Klaus, Jaime and, and I started um, uh, meeting regularly and this went on until the end of 2020. Um, and then the discussion revolved around a bunch of pretty thorny design points, basically um, the, the extensibility of the semantics of PDs and, and in parallel how one discovers any um, per API extended semantics. Um, then, then, then we entered a three months hiatus uh, due to a number of reasons that happened to affect all uh, the three of us at the same time. And unfortunately, during that time, the draft expired. Um, fast forward April 2021, uh, we have restarted the activity um, on, on PD together with the rest of Coral. Um, okay, so next, please. Uh, so open issues. If you, so, so, so if you look at the open issues on GitHub, you'll see roughly three categories. Uh, first is the purely editorial stuff uh, that just sits there waiting for one of us to, to you know, to, to shake his laziness and go f through the 10, 15 minutes rigmarole to drag the issue to done. Um, and the, the second category comprises um, a bunch of issues that are related to the completion of this so-called common data model. Um, uh, the common data model is split roughly in two regions. Uh, first, a set of basic attributes that we know have general applicability, even if they won't be there in any case. They can be they can be optional, but we know they exist for all cases. And, and then there's a second set uh, of optional attributes that we call per feature. Klaus came up with this nomenclature, and and um, 
these are targeted to use cases that we think are common enough to be worth codifying, you know, but, uh, but um, they may not make sense in the general case. For example, if, uh, so if you need to forward the API errors to a, um, to your log analytics engine, you may need to enrich the, the basic error report with some specific declaration, for example, the co op error codes that would otherwise um, uh, get lost at, at, at the transaction layer, right? Um, and this is the kind of uh, attributes that we're looking at here, the per use case. Uh, and, and this is work in progress. We know what to do. Uh, we have identified the various a bunch of categories that we want to codify. We haven't done it fully yet. There's an open PR, I think, uh, pending since a while. Um, and, and this may be an order of magnitude more effort compared to, to what is needed to the editorial stuff that I was mentioning before, but, but it's still bounded effort. Um, and then, and then there's a third category and, um, and this, this bit is concerned with the, the extensible part of the data model. And this is where we spent, uh, most, if not all, uh, of our meeting time until December last year going through the problem space, you know, analyzing the existing solutions and so on. Um, and we don't have a complete answer yet. We came up with a tentative proposal that currently sits in, an, uh, in a draft that is unpublished, uh, which is likely to need some polishing before we can present. Um, now, the goal that we set for, for this mechanism are quite ambitious. We want it to be um, easy to register uh, for a developer, you know, ideally zero friction and be stable as well. We still want to allow a competent representation of 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 the data. Um, um, we have the complementary problem of discoverability of the API characteristics, um, and PD sits there as one instance of the bigger problem. Right. Um, uh, we also have a composability problem, and by that I mean how we mix and match different API spaces in a non-clashing way. And then on top of that, we want to avoid segmentation between private and public spaces. In fact, my, the initial proposal, we did suffer from the, what Karsten called the X dash problem, uh, uh, which means the, the fact that private code points can trickle and persist into the public sphere. Um, so we surely don't want to deal with this. And one simple way to, uh, to avoid that, we just get rid of the root cause from the onset. Um, so yeah, this is, the quick summary of the problems that we need to solve. Um, next, please. Okay, so what's the plan? Um, this is a tentative thing, so I would like to discuss this. Uh, but before, so my idea is that before uh, the cutoff, the next meeting, uh, we we should address the uh, all the issues in category A and B from from the previous slide. Uh, it looks it looks like an achievable plan to me. I would like to hear uh, Klaus and Jaime. Jaime is not here, right? But Klaus is here. What do you think? Uh, I have to admit that I haven't read the, the latest draft. So um, I, I think that there's the opportunity to make some progress until the, the IDF uh, deadline. I'm not sure how far we can get, but uh, we should definitely uh, bring the uh, latest ideas into the draft and, and see how, how much we can do. So I, okay. I'm up to it for the next couple of weeks. Okay. Okay. But you know, it, it's looking at it, I've looked recently at the um, issue list and scanned through the various uh, things that are there, and th there are a few of them that that seems very reasonable and achievable. So. I think I would do that. Um, I think the, the more difficult ones are really in, in the area of coral. Yeah, where exactly. we had most discussions, exactly. and and then exactly. uh, the problem details draft is pr probably uh, mostly an exercise in in defining the vocabularies for mm -hmm. for the different uh, that's, error types. And that's so exactly exactly what I wanted to say. So yeah. that can, these two categories A and B can be solved, you know, because they pertain to the data model and they are abstract. But then we have the the accessibility part uh, uh, that we need the, the wider coral discussion regarding dic dictionaries and discovery to converge into some usable mechanism. And, and as you say, once once that is that is done, it's just a matter of reusing the relevant bits of whatever we have designed there in in PD. But, but until that is done, it, this draft needs to wait. I'm afraid. 
And, and I appreciate this may sound suboptimal, but this is uh, basically what we consciously signed for when we, when we decided that PD should, should share his fate with Coral. It's sort of unavoidable. Um, so we, we have the dependency on Coral, um, but we, we don't have a blocker. So we, we can basically run the whole uh, problem details draft to finish. And, and then it might be stuck uh, for, for a while, uh, potentially wait, mm. waiting for Coral mm. to finish. But, but mm. we don't have to wait for, for certain features, for example, to show up in Coral first before we can do the work on problem details. Uh, well, the accessibility is sort of dependent on that, though. Coral already has um, an excellent ability. It's just not that efficient, and then we want to improve it, and, and that's why we are having all those discussions. Right. So you, you can already use vocabulary from different um, places in the same Coral document. J j just the mechanics on how you do it exactly on the wire is not finalized yet. Yeah which sort of make it non-deployable, isn't it? Well, you, you can, if you, if you implement the latest expired Coral draft, then you have mm. something deployable, but the draft is likely to change mm. because of all the great discussions we had. Okay, so, but then, of course. Um... Right. Yeah. Well, at, at the same time, if you want to look at it positively, we, this could become an incentive to make progress on the other side, right? So, uh, since I tend to be an optimistic fellow, um, <laughs> you know, um, yeah, I think I think this is where the presentation ends, and uh, this is sort of the plan for the short term and mid term. Sounds good. Uh, thanks, Thomas. Um, you mentioned the issues. I just have them open in the in the tab beside. Do you want to check any of them in particular? Before we go into the details, um, no. I have uh, two two more high level questions. Um, one is um, the the JSON uh, problem details uh, document has been out for a while. Mm. Is there maybe anything we can learn from that experiment? Uh, I don't know. They, they are doing the piece right at this point in time. So maybe they have gone through the process of uh, uh, absorbing lessons from from existing deployments. Where, I will, I will that check happening? that. Sorry? Where is that happening? In HTTP API, I think. Ah, good. Okay. Maybe I should yeah. try to search that space. 7A to 7Bs in uh, yeah, HTTP API. You would find okay. that. Okay. Thank you. And the, the other question is, is really out there. Um, if we want to tackle the X dash uh, problem, mm. uh, there are several aspects to it. But one aspect is um, efficiency in encoding, where we uh, tend to give the non X dash uh, code points. Uh, uh, better encoding than the X dash uh, code points. Mm -hmm. uh, so essentially, even even though it, it really isn't that important uh, from a technical point of view, uh, from a point of view of, of getting the the uh, processes in place and and the INR stuff and so on, <clears throat> I think the it's really important to think about uh, how you can avoid uh, doing a first class, second class citizen uh, thing here. Exactly. Yeah, and I agree completely. The the one area where I think we managed to hit that um, is in the the core SIDS. And maybe we should think about how core SIDS, or maybe an approach like core SIDS, but but we we I hope we soon have the core SIDS uh, available to us. How that can actually solve the the problem of uh, having to give different efficiency classes uh, to different uh, people because uh, i mean in reality sids will will be four bytes or less so it, it's uh, um, usually very efficient in particular 
Carsten, you're gone. Hello. Coco. Maybe I dropped. Uh, I can still hear you, Thomas, ah, but I can't ah. hear Carsten. Okay. He just chatted that he's done with his pod. Okay. Yeah. So in, in our discussions, we uh, came up with a bunch of criteria. Like uh, we, we really want to have a low barrier to entry. Uh, ideally, um, if you just want to prototype your application, you shouldn't have to first interact with an IANA registry or so before you even can, can put some dummy values in, into your uh, um, yeah. proof of concept. And, yeah. and then, of course, we want to have uh, compact identifiers. We, we want to be able to mix and match uh, uh, error types and, and uh, error details from, from different um, uh, domains and, and so on. And uh, we, we have looked at SITs, and, and SITs are, are good um, for um, the, 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 um, the, 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 the world uh, where, where it's applied to. Um, so you, you have these uh, consecutively um, in increasing IDs uh, very frequently, and um, you, you have already some um, me mechanism to formally define the, the available properties and, and so on. So SITS is a really good um, approach to that. But I, I guess Coral and uh, problem details in, in the end might be even less formally uh, organized than, than the Komai world. Um, so you, you have re really um, developers who, who are building some APIs and they need an error code and they just need to put a value somewhere in their code and, and not go to a website first and uh, register an account and, and so on. And uh, one, one proposal that we are having now is these uh, namespace tables, uh, as we have called it, uh, it has a GitHub issue, um, which allows you at least uh, to use um, items on multiple vocabularies. And uh, it doesn't matter if those vocabularies are then some private ones or public ones, um, you, you can just pull from, from any vocabulary that exists. And it doesn't even have to be defined for, for this purpose. It just has to have a certain uh, number scheme. So more, 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 a lot of IANA registries, for example, can, can be already pulled in using these namespace tables. But, but there are still some unresolved uh, issues even with those namespace tables. And in particular, uh, how, how do you know uh, which namespace table to use? Uh, and that brings us to the earlier point on if we have more context for URI, but we stick our security information and our vocabulary namespace tables in, into that as well. So there, there, there's still a bit of work needed. Okay, since we have some minutes more, uh, just to double check with you, Thomas, if you wanted to go through some issue in particular. Uh, not really, Marco. Okay. Then I think we are done with the main topics for today and we are on the any other business. So is there any other point you wanted to raise today about core? I do think that this topic of getting cost a URI will need a bit more discussion, but I, that's mm -hmm. probably best started on the mailing list. Right. So it seems you cannot hear me at the moment. We can hear you we now. Can. Welcome okay. back. I just uh, mentioned something completely different. Uh, but uh, it, it may be useful in a world that uses SIBO and JSON and all these things. Uh, you know about uh, j the JSON path activity, and on Tuesday we had a long discussion about whether we could be doing regular expressions there, and of course the main problem is that there are so many to choose from. Uh, and um, so, um, yeah, this, this kept bothering me, and uh, I decided that is a problem that needs to be solved. Um, so I wrote a draft 
with yet another regex scheme. Um, but it, it's not XKCD 927 or whatever the number is um, because it's a subset of everything else. Um, so um, if you care, you may, might want to have a look at the iRegEx uh, uh, proposal that I submitted uh, today. And I hope we will be able to integrate this into JSON path, uh, but it might also be useful in, in other uh, uh, query languages like in the discovery context for for core uh, and so on so um, yeah just just have a look if you care about regular expressions uh, if you don't uh, uh, don't waste your time Karsten could you please add the link to the minutes uh, yes uh, Go to the data tracker and, and search iRegExp. Okay, we look for it later. Thank you. Okay, anything else you wanted to discuss? Maybe you can make a sneak peek on the upcoming agenda. Oh, of course, <laughs> we'll meet again in two weeks, uh, same time, same venue. Uh, the main topic uh, for that meeting is Coral, uh, the main Coral document and also fully a comparison or discussion around its relation with SDF. Um, so the other thing is the core Yang SIG stuff. Um, it's uh, waiting for a new ID for close to two months now. The chairs know about this state. Well, the status that I'm still trying to get a meeting together between the people who know about these drafts and the problem is that both bring them down, the better. I lost all of Carson's reply, but he said he didn't, he couldn't get a meeting together for the authors. That's what I understood. Yes. Uh, are there any implementers by now known uh, outside the group of authors? I, I have implemented, and uh, we are depending upon this code, uh, this stuff to proceed in the uh, Anima constrained voucher work. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Um, I don't know what to do. Uh, the authors are very unresponsive is the problem regularly for two or three years so anyway. yeah so one way of course would be to short circuit them and just uh, go ahead and and fix things maybe that's also a way to make them wake up again okay. so if the, if the working group wants me to do that i will do that Let me help. Sure. So what do you do? You just send pull requests on their documents and see what happens? Yeah, and we could also merge them and publish a new draft and, and everything. Um, yeah, well, that, that would be step two, yeah. <laughs> Check also with Francesca. Yeah, I think the, the the chairs at some point need to decide who the authors of these, uh, who the editors of these these documents are. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, uh, but I'm also interested in knowing are there technical reasons why things are as weird as they are 
in, in these areas. And uh, that's why I really would like to talk with the existing uh, authors to get this done. So I, I wouldn't do this lightly. Okay. We have a pretty long section for the any other business in the minutes now. <laughs> Great. <laughs> uh, coming back to the agenda of next interim, you said uh, one part is coral and one part is uh, coral and SDF. Can, can you say a few more words on both? Because I'm not sure if I can or should prepare something for, for each section. Uh, I suggested to check with Jaime because that proposal came from him actually. And it was okay. interesting to see uh, how Coral could help SDF and, and vice versa. So I think the the interesting thing to look at is uh, the the Web of Things people, the W3C people, have thing descriptions, and now they are emulating SDF with uh, thing description templates. And um, maybe that's something we want to look at in the Coral space uh, as well. So we we have instances and classes and now i have no idea how this will mm. but if nothing else it, it's giving us some things to think about in on the crawl side yeah think about on the coral side, kind of new requirements. Yeah, mo mostly about the the uh, instance versus stars thing. Yeah. Okay, so the the general idea would be we take an SDF file, we we sprinkle some hypermedia controls uh, inside of it, and then we have a thing description. That's well, the, the, the objective is not to arrive at a thing description. The objective is, is to arrive at a good way to use Coral. Okay. So, sounds like an interesting discussion. I'm looking forward to that. An ignorant question here. So how, how do you serialize a, a, a thing description thing? That's JSON LD. Okay. And people are actually oh. looking at something called Seaball LG now which I must admit I don't understand yet. I've looked briefly at the draft and it looks like it's primarily really taking uh, taking a JSON LD, ensuring there are no inline uh, contexts around anymore, and then translating it pretty much one-to-one -to, -one to, to CBO for compactness with some optimizations, but model-wide it's, it's a translation. Where is that happening? W3C. Is there a CBO LD working group or, or where should I look? Wait a second, I will check. Oh, it's one of Manu's Bonnie's things. Yeah. So it's not JSON LD one one in Cibor is Cibor LD. Okay, here digital bazaar GitHub value. Yeah, that one. Thanks for the link. Cheers. White tears. Okay. Anything more to add also in preparation for the next interim? So I, I heard I don't have to prepare anything, right? <laughs> <laughs> I 
mean, I can bring cake, but but you would have to come to Sweden to pick it up. Uh, what good is me? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, guys, uh, if there are no other points, uh, we can adjourn the meeting here. Thanks all for a good discussion. Talk to you, you. latest in two weeks. Cool. Cheers. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.